obligated to begin this lecture with uh, something of a confession. Uh, I am definitely not a philosopher. Um, I, uh, I found a, a pretty banged up copy of Camus' Myth of Sisyphus on a stoop a couple years ago, and I made a hobby of the past few years of reading as much philosophy as I could and trying to make uh, some kind of sense of it. Um, <laughs> I am a musician by trade, uh, so I hope if my understanding of philosophy is a bit crude, my understanding of music aspires to sophistication, and uh, my synthesis of the two is at least interesting, if not perfectly constructed. Um, now is as good a time as any to mention that this speech is in connection with Brooklyn Art Song Society's upcoming concert at the Brooklyn Historical Society, um, La France 4, uh, La France Moderne, and um, I'll be premiering a work by Jean Barraquet, the subject of tonight's speech. And um, if you're interested, sign up for our mailing list after come find me or my lovely wife who's right there, and you'll receive a free ticket to this event because uh, what's a speech about Marxism without a shameless plug, right? Um, so my, my primary goals of this speech are two, um, to take two somewhat important and somewhat obscure schools of thought that were relevant at roughly the same period of time in 20th century uh, France, structural Marxism and total serialism, and argue that they are each manifestations of one unified worldview, um, realizing themselves in their respective fields of philosophy and music, um, and making the connection between two admittedly rarefied subjects. I hope to make the argument that both structural Marxism and total serialism contain relevant truths that can directly affect our understanding of the world in worthwhile and concrete ways. Um, before I go any further, I would like to um, offer two quotes that I think justify my connection in these two subjects. Um, the first is by uh, Jacques Ranciere, who I'll discuss a little later, um, in a separate work entitled The Politics of Aesthetics. He writes, a theoretical discourse is always simultaneously an aesthetic form. Um, and I'd like to pair this with a quote by um, Jean Barraquet, the composer I'll discuss also later, on an article he wrote by, on Debussy, where he states simply, music is a philosophy. Um, these quotes don't irrefutably justify everything I'm going to say, but at least I think they give me good reason to assume commonality. Um, the best definition of structural Marxism comes from a rather simple but profound summing up by the leader's de facto founder, Louis Athuzet, who says, society is, quote, the effects of structures, <clears throat> the effects of a structure of structures. Um, Reading Capital is the magnum opus of this movement, and it was published in 1965. Um, Althusser wrote two sections of the work, and he oversaw five of his students constructing the rest of the sections. Um, for this talk, I'm focusing on three of those, uh, Louis Althusser himself, uh, Jacques Rancière, and Etienne Balabar. Um, Reading Capital is a deep dive into Karl Marx's landmark critique of capitalist society, Das Kapital. Uh, the premise is this. Instead of taking the work at face value, as most Marxists had in the past, the structural Marxists hope to reread the work in various new contexts. Regardless of their methodologies, the structural Marxists came to the same conclusion. Society is made up of predictable, exact structures determined by the means of production, interacting with each other in complex and invisible ways. Um, if you take the superstructure of society and break it down into its individual parts, you will find that what once seems like the haphazard result of individual free will is actually being governed by forces that are scientifically precise. Uh, the question the book seeks to answer is why the average person is not aware of this phenomenon. Um, Louis Althusser's first chapter's primary argument for why we feel, fail to see this structure of structures is because of ideology. That is, preconceived assumptions about how the world is passed down from various institutions with vested interests in the capitalist system. Althusser contrasts ideology with his concept of science. In his words, science, quote, depends less for its life on what it knows than on what it does not know. Its absolute precondition is to focus on this unknown and to pose it in the rigor of a problem. 
However, in Althusser's mind, and again I quote, the whole history of Western philosophy is dominated not by the problem of knowledge, but by the ideological solution, i.e. the solution imposed in, <clears throat> in advance by practical religious, ethical, and political interests foreign to the reality of knowledge. The standardly held narratives we rely on to understand reality are by their very nature poisoned by ideology, according to Althusser. They are assumptions we inherited from the institutions that exist to keep the means of production in the hands of capitalists and the workers in a constant state of exploitation. For Althusser, seeing reality for what it is through science means resisting the urge for neat categorizations and easy explanations. He writes, producing scientific knowledge means acting with disorder as if it were an order and using it as an order. This is why the structure of science is never transparent, but opaque, divided, and incomplete. Uh, the next section of Reading Capital, uh, Jacques Rancière takes Althusser's line of reasoning one step farther. Rancière argues that ideology doesn't just obscure understanding by presenting a different conception of reality. <clears throat> Ideologies present precisely the opposite of what is true in a capitalist society. He writes, the development of the forms of the capitalist process is thus governed by the law of inversion. The forms in which the process of capitalist production presents itself <coughs> or, or appears are rigorously inverted with respect to its inner determination. Um, when I read Rancière's argument about the law of inversion, I am reminded of the famous Snickers campaign, uh, hungry, eat a Snickers. Um, it is, to me, obvious that if you are actually hungry, the worst possible thing you can eat is a Snickers, because the sugar just makes you even hungrier, and you're gonna get diabetes if every time you're hungry you eat Snickers. But in order for the CEOs of the Mars Candy Company to continue to sell candy at a rate so they can make a profit and keep their factories open and keep all their workers employed, it's essential that everyone believe not just that Snickers are a tasty treat, but that Snickers will make you full. That is, to me, the capitalist law of inversion. Um, finally, Etienne Balabar, in his chapter, The Basic Concept of Historical Materialism, takes a slightly different approach to explaining the two mechanisms driving capitalist society. To him, the answer lies in our understanding of history. To most, history is linear and monolithic, one simple structure. <coughs> um, but to Balabar, history is a counterpoint of multiple different structures defined by their various means of production, all overlapping and coexisting in a superstructure. He writes, the fact that each of these times and each of these histories is relatively autonomous does not make them so many domains which are independent of the whole. The specificity of each of these times and each of these histories, in other words, their relative autonomy and independence is based on a certain type of articulation in the whole and therefore on a certain type, <coughs> therefore on a certain type of dependence with respect to the whole. What we experience as one finite point in time is actually various beginnings, middles, and ends interacting with each other. This gives history the feeling of a chaotic, messy sweep, when in reality it functions like a Swiss clock with hundreds of complex but precise parts. Um, now I'd like to somewhat awkwardly switch gears to the musical portion of, of my talk. Um, total serialism was a compositional technique associated with several composers who came to prominence in the 1950s. Pierre Boulez, Karlheinz Stockhausen, and Jean Barraquet are just a few. It evolved out of the 12-tone technique developed in the 1920s and 30s by the second Viennese school composers, Arnold Schoenberg, Alban Berg, and Anton Webern. 12-tone technique arranged the 12 unique notes of the chromatic scale in a predetermined order to be used as the basic structure of musical form. The structure, called a row, could be manipulated in various ways, played backwards, upside down, fragmented into smaller units, but it remained the invisible, ever-present determining force of the music. The result was music that lacked a tonal center, was not in a key, the way that works by Mozart, Bach, and all your favorite composers had necessarily been. Total serialism took the techniques uh, that 12-tone composers applied to pitch and extended it to all other elements of music, the rhythm, the dynamics, articulation, etc. 
Each had their own row that combined with each other row to form a whole. The total series were creating a quote unquote structure of structures in music. Um, in fact, one of the earliest examples of total serialism was a work by Pierre Belez for two pianos called, you can probably guess, Structures. Um, the shift from 12-tone technique to total serialism was not just a shift in process, it was a shift in philosophy. 12-tone composers accepted the dominant ideological foundations of tonal music, even if they used different comp a different compositional method. A work by Schoenberg was meant to provide an aesthetic experience for an educated bourgeoisie class that had become dominant in the later iteration of industrial capitalism. 12-tone composers were convinced they were part of an ongoing tradition and aspired to be accepted and appreciated by society at large. They often evoked well-known tonal forms in their titles, a suite of variations, symphony, sonata, concerto. Anton Webern famously said he hoped one day the milkman would be whistling serial 12-tone music while delivering milk on his route. Um, on the other hand, the total serialists saw tonality not as a means of creating a piece of music, but an ideology, not unlike the ideologies Althusser criticizes in Reading Capital. Of the aforementioned work structures, Pierre Boulez writes, I wanted to eradicate from my vocabulary absolutely every trace of the conventional. I then wanted gradually, element after element, to win back the various stages of the compositional process in such a manner that a perfectly new synthesis might arise, a synthesis that would not be corrupted from the very outset by stylistic reminiscences. In other words, Boulez wanted to remove all traces of past ideologies from his music. Tonality was an assumption about how music should be created that had gone unquestioned for too long. And the total serialists, the antidote was a new scientific approach. Um, I'd like to now, uh, if our technical, if, are we good with the, um, yeah. I'd like to now play a, just a brief work uh, by Jean Barraquet uh, a snippet of it called uh, Sequence, so you can hear what this scientific music sounds like. Um, total serialism, for all its formal rigor, sounds like anarchy. <laughs> um, in fact, the music has its own law of inversion, a la Jacques Ancier. Uh, the more strictly organized music is, the more it seems chaotic on the surface. Total serialism is designed to challenge our perception. If we experience something that is so demonstrably structured as anarchy, perhaps that which we perceive as ordered is not what it appears to be. Um, Barraquet sums this sentiment up nicely in the aforementioned essay 
uh, on Debussy uh, when he says, the problem of music is that there is chaos in coherence. Um, total serialism is the aesthetic embodiment of Althusser's definition of scientific knowledge, acting with disorder as if it were an order. Um, Jean Barraquet's total serialism is unique to his contemporaries. Uh, in a work like Sequence, Barraquet created rows of rows, or superstructures that would extend for thousands and thousands of notes. Um, in addition, unlike those of his contemporaries, Barraquet's rows are constantly evolving, gradually changing shape over the course of a work. Um, often, different iterations of the row overlap, and their beginnings, middles, and ends are obscured in a dense texture of sound. Much like Balabar's conception of music historical materialism, Barraquet's music has an outward appearance of chaos that is the byproduct of the evolution of exact structures. Balabar draws a conclusion about history that could be easily transferred to an understanding of one of Barraquet's scores. We cannot restrict ourselves to reflecting the existence of visible and measurable times. We must, of absolute necessity, pose the question of the mode of existence of invisible times, of the invisible rhythms and punctuations concealed beneath the surface of each visible time. Um, for my conclusion, I would like to badly misquote the first sentence of philosophy I ever read. Um, there is but one truly serious philosophical problem, and that is, who cares? Um, why should we listen to this music that sounds completely out of tune and read obtuse Marxist philosophy? I would argue these two schools of thought give us directly relevant truths that we ignore at our peril. Structural Marxism and total serialism give us an awareness of how steeped in ideology our thinking is, how much of our thinking feels right rather than is really known by scientific inquiry. It teaches us that when a narrative feeds into our already held beliefs, we should be instantly suspicious rather than eager to accept. Ideology hides the true workings of society behind easily digestible answers and the impression of harmonious order, just like tonal music seems like it is organized but is actually based on the whim of a composer. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, we find, when we find the truth, it will be ugly. It will be complex. It will not be what it seemed on the surface. Uh, <clears throat> I find that, uh, in fairness, even Althusser, despite his insights into the power of ideology, often fell into reciting communist dogma uncritically in his writings. Uh, by the 1970s, the raw energy and power of total serialism had devolved into rigidity and academia and tediousness and had become an ideology unto itself in many ways. But to me, this makes the truth of ideology more, not less relevant since its power can take hold even those who are completely aware of its impact. Personally, I'm not sure if we can ever be fully outside of ideology, or even if we should be. But what I do know is in today's political and social climate, where everyone gets their information from the echo chambers of Facebook and cable news, and it's so easy to have our worldviews reinforced, what truth could be more relevant than this? The noise you don't understand is actually the music you need to hear. Thank you. Thank you.